All right, welcome. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. I hope you can all hear me out there. And uh, welcome to our final webinar of the fall 2017 series. Um, and this webinar is on the essential role of adjuncts in OER adoption and degrees. So a very important topic. And um, I have three experts who are here to share with you the work that they do in this area. And uh, before I go to our agenda slide, I just want to send our best wishes out to our colleagues in Southern California who are in those areas where the wildfires are occurring. Um, our best wishes to all of you. All right, our agenda. Um, I'm going to introduce my speakers and uh, then I'll give you our brief uh, overview of CCCOER for those of you who might be new. And I want to mention Open Education Week uh, 2018, which is coming up in March. And then we will get right to our presentations. Um, from uh, first up, we'll be Achieving the Dream, John Iozzini, um, who runs the program there, Engaging Adjunct Faculty in the Student Success Movement. And then uh, we will have um, our, some of our college members we will, from Broward College in Florida will be sharing um, their Dean of Information Technology, will be sharing uh, their OER degree work. And Claudine Dulaney, of their business law adjunct faculty, will be sharing the work she does there as well. All right, and here they are. So um, I, first up, I'd like to introduce John, and John is the Associate Director there at Teaching and Learning, I'm sorry, the Associate Director, Director of Teaching and Learning at Achieving the Dream. John? Hi, everybody. It's good to be with you. Um, I've been at Achieving the Dream about a year and a half, and previously I worked at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, leading their Teaching and Creativity Center. Wonderful. Thanks for being with us today, John. And next, I'd like to introduce Tom Ayers, who is the Dean of Information Technology and the OER Degree Lead at Broward College. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been at Broward College since 2014 and have been happy to spend a 25 plus year uh, career in higher education. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. And um, last but not least, the, the really important voice here is Claudine Dulaney, who is adjunct business law faculty at Broward College. Thank you, Una. Welcome, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Claudine Dulaney. I am adjunct at Broward College, as well as another university in a litigation and e-discovery uh, program. And uh, I have recently uh, been involved with OER in developing and teaching, and so I'm excited to share my experience with you today. Thank you, Claudine. All right. For those of you who might be new to um, our webinars, um, I always like to repeat the CCC OER mission. We were founded 10 years ago uh, this fall, and uh, so we're really happy um, and excited um, to celebrate that with you. Um, our mission really hasn't changed in 10 years, although so many other things have changed in the open education space around how we, how we do this work. Um, but really, it's about uh, providing awareness and access to high quality open educational resources and open educational practices. Uh, and these webinars are part of that professional development that we offer to um, faculty and administrators um, and instructional designers and librarians who, who participate with us. And finally, at the heart of it is improving student success. And, um, hopefully having our students um, complete their degrees with uh, lower debt or, or without debt. Um, I just want to mention our members. We have members now in 26 U.S. states. Um, we have nine statewide consortiums, and uh, this is a little bit of a preview, but Hawaii, the community colleges of Hawaii are joining us shortly as a member, and we're really excited about that. We're going to have to change our map so that uh, we include Hawaii. And so sorry for the omission earlier, but we'll be changing up our map to include that uh, one of the states that's not in the continental uh, 48. So very excited about that. 
Uh, finally, before we get to our main presentation, I do want to men mention Open Education Week, uh, which is coming up in March. This is the sixth year. The Open Education Consortium, my parent organization, sponsors this, and of course, CCCOER is quite active in this. For those of you who haven't participated in the past, it's a global celebration of the open education movement. Um, its goal is, of course, at raising awareness of open education and its impact on teaching and learning worldwide. Many of our colleges um, um, hold local events uh, during that week um, for their faculty and um, other staff involved in OER and their students, I should say. Um, and um, some do webinars and we you can submit in all of the events that you're holding either locally on your campus or any webinars or videos or resources that you want to share globally um, at the at this website there's a call for proposal which just opened this week so we're really looking forward to that we also in CCCOER we will be running a number of webinars that week so another opportunity to get together um, and also something for you to share with um, folks back at your campus if they want to participate um, globally. So I hope many of you will uh, have an opportunity to participate with with that in that with us. And so I before we introduce uh, or take this directly to our speakers today, I just wanted to review very quickly with you um, this fact uh, that I heard for, actually from John Iazzini at Achieving the Dream, which is over 50% of community colleges courses are taught by adjunct faculty. And I think many of us know that um, our, the number of adjunct faculty at our campus often exceed 50% and sometimes are quite a bit larger percentage. And so they play a really important role in, in the work that we do and in our student success. And OER can help level the playing field. Um, the professional development that some of the colleges are offering to their adjunct faculty really helps to improve the pedagogy um, overall for, um, for faculty at the campuses. Um, and also adjunct faculty are often working at multiple institutions. Claudine mentioned this. Um, and so they have an overview that perhaps some of the full-time faculty don't. And they're often able to bring unique strengths um, to your institution. And so OER, because of the open license nature, uh, can allow that. Um, for them to bring those those um, other strengths materials into the classroom to um, help students and What we're hearing is that this is improving faculty engagement uh, certainly for the adjunct faculty uh, because they're being integrated uh, more into um, Faculty development and other aspects at the institution and that students are more engaged um, when the adjunct faculty are bringing in uh, their own unique strengths and, um, and improving their pedagogy. So now I'm going to turn to our experts here to tell you exactly how that's going. So John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Una. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to thank CCCOER for hosting this. And I appreciate the turnout. I know this is a very busy time of the year for folks, and I think it's great that we're able to come together in conversation on a really important topic. Um, and John, do you okay. want to access the, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I just asked for control of the screen. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Let's see. I can move that for you if you'd like, John. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so just a little bit about us. I can see from the names uh, on the list of participants, we have some folks here uh, who are involved with Achieving the Dream, some who are involved with the project I'll be talking about today. But for those of you who are less familiar with us as an organization, our mission is to lead and support a national network of community colleges to achieve sustainable institutional transformation through the sharing of knowledge, innovative solutions, and effective practices and policies that lead to improved outcomes for all students. We work with um, over 200 community colleges around the country. We also began working in the past year with over 30 tribal colleges and universities. And so across the board, our students um, have you know, a similar profile in terms of uh, very frequently being underprepared for college level work. Um, and they're at institutions which are very frequently under-resourced themselves. 
And so the work is challenging, but we find that there is um, success when we undertake initiatives that lead to true institutional change, as opposed to small boutique pilot initiatives that may only affect a department here or a small unit there. And so uh, what I want to make clear is I think this work uh, in developing OER degrees can be thought of that way in terms of institutional change. So this is our institutional capacity framework. There are seven areas um, in which we seek to work with our network colleges. When colleges begin to work with us, they do a self-assessment um, that helps us to see how they're doing in each of these areas. And so teaching and learning is a, one of the seven key areas. It's the area that I specialize in. But what we find is that so much of the work we undertake cuts across more than one of these areas. And so, for example, the Engaging Adjunct Faculty Initiative that I'm uh, uh, collaborating on with six of our leader colleges really cuts across a few of these areas, primarily teaching and learning, but there are issues of equity there, there are issues of engagement and communication, there are issues of policies and practices. So this uh, is a, a grant-funded initiative, a two-year planning and implementation grant. It began summer of 2016. It will wind down this coming summer, 2018. It's funded by the Helmsley Trust and the Great Lakes Higher Education Guarantee Corporation. And the goal of the project is to develop practices and policies that support adjunct faculty in improving instruction and becoming engaged in student success initiatives. Uh, we have six of our leader colleges engaged in the project, and I can tell you that 40 colleges applied to be part of it. So clearly, nationally, we're seeing there's a real need and interest in this kind of work. Um, Una gave you the data about uh, the very high uh, rate of the use of adjunct faculty in the community college sector, but I think we're seeing across the board um, in higher ed, there's a greater, an increasing reliance um, on adjunct faculty. We could go back for just a second to that list of those colleges. Thank you. Um, so we've got the Community College of Baltimore County, Community College of Philadelphia, Delta College, Harper College, Patrick Henry Community College, and Renton Technical College. And we chose these six. Uh, they had very strong proposals, but we were also careful to choose six colleges that um, present a diverse range in terms of the size of the institution, the setting of the institution. Some of these are urban, large urban schools. Some of them are small rural schools. We have schools that are in suburban settings. Some are unionized and some are not. And we know that each of these variables really matters when it comes to thinking in innovative ways about how to engage any faculty, full-time, contingent, whatever. We know that those variables matter. And so we want to be sure that what we're learning in this project is replicable to as many institutions as possible. Okay. So there are two key threads to this work, and both of these are really critical um, to have that outcome of deeper engagement of adjunct faculty. On the one hand, we know it's really important that institutions pay attention in new ways to what's going on in the classroom and how we design and implement faculty development programming for adjunct faculty that really gets at strengthening classroom practice. Um, in addition, though, that is not sufficient. We need to also be looking at how institutions hire, recognize, evaluate, incentivize adjunct faculty, how adjunct faculty are represented in shared governance processes. So I'm going to talk uh, here right now a little bit in detail about what some of these activities look like, because I think the mechanisms that we're seeing uh, that are working would really be helpful for institutions that want to pull as many adjunct faculty as possible into this work with OER degrees. So first and foremost, when we're thinking about how to move the needle in classroom practice, we know number one, it is not sufficient to say, we've created these great faculty development programs for full-time faculty, uh, everyone is welcome to attend. Um, the problem usually is that those programs are offered, you know, in the middle of the day, um, they may only be promoted at faculty meetings and departments where only the full-time faculty are invited. That's not a particularly inclusive design. 
And so it's important that your Center for Teaching and Learning or whatever your faculty development unit or committee is, it's really important that there's a charge there that that group is designing programming exclusively for adjunct faculty. It's great if you can also design programming that everyone understands is intended for everyone and that, that kind of programming can be a mechanism to bring together full-time and adjunct faculty, but you must design programming that's available at the times your adjunct faculty can access it. And that might mean different things at different institutions. I think sometimes we assume you're gonna to have to offer things in the evening for adjunct faculty to, to be there, and that may be true at many institutions, but you really need to survey your own adjunct faculty. You need to know who they are. You need to know, are these folks you know, people who are stringing together a living by working at three or four different institutions? Or are they people who have a full-time career and they're just coming to your campus one night a week? In some cases, they may be people who work full-time already at your institution in another role. And now they're working part-time as an instructor for a course or two. So you really need to understand who they are and why they work at your institution as adjunct faculty to then be able to understand what kinds of programming is going to meet their needs and when that programming needs to happen, and then what are the incentives to engage in that programming. But I can envision that you, um, once you've identified those key pieces, then you could start to design institutes or faculty learning communities or whatever the, the style of programming is that works well for your institution. You could do those now with a focus on redesigning courses for open educational resources, uh, creating a course that can be part of an OER degree, but you first have to take a few steps back. You know, you know what your goal is around trying to engage adjunct faculty in OER work, but you've got to figure out um, at a very um, detailed granular, granular level, what kind of programming is going to work, what's the format, when does it need to be offered so that adjunct faculty will participate. We know across the board that cohort-based faculty development has a much greater impact on people's practice than one-off workshops. And of course, that requires a greater commitment for people to be attending meetings you know, once a month or more. But we know that if you can bring together groups of faculty, let's say eight to 12 faculty uh, as a faculty learning community, um, as a teaching circle, as a faculty inquiry group, and they're meeting on a regular basis, they're going to push each other's thinking and they're going to impact each other's work um, in really meaningful ways. I also want to encourage you to think about what the climate is like at your institution on a very broad scale. Alison Cadlick, um, who's recently uh, left public agenda and has started a, a really new interesting organization called SOVA, um, gave a great keynote at the Michigan Student Success Summit earlier this fall. And she talked about the importance of moving beyond buy-in. So when you're thinking about any kind of institutional change, you want to be thinking not just about getting faculty to buy in, not just about getting adjunct faculty to buy in, but rather having them help lead the work, having them help drive the work. And so this means you need to get to more than just acceptance, and certainly you need to move beyond a simple lack of people resisting whatever the change is. Very often when we um, are surfacing resistance, we see it happening, we can feel it happening from our colleagues, but we're not sure why it's happening. And I think we jump too quickly to just trying to address the resistance instead of understanding what's motivating it. That's really important, I think, when we think about a vulnerable population of colleagues like adjunct faculty. If we're experiencing resistance to change like this, we need to know where it's coming from. As I said, bringing faculty to the table so that they are helping to lead this kind of work so that they are helping to drive the work is critical. So we need to have faculty as co-owners. That's what makes change durable. And I think what we're also talking about here is creating a healthy, positive climate at our institution. So we could be talking about OER work today, but we could be talking about a different kind of initiative a year from now. And you know, we want to be sure that we're not just pushing our colleagues into a sense of initiative fatigue. Some people have jumped on board with open educational resources months ago, years ago, and they are, they've been leading that work now for some time and they're continuing to bring new people into that mix. We don't want them to get burned out on that work. And so it's critical 
that we create a climate on our campus that's healthy and positive. And so there's five key points that I'm going to leave you with. The first is it's critical to find a strong connection between um, the personal values of faculty, staff, and administrators and the goals of whatever this change or innovation are. If you've been on these webinars before with CCC OER, I think you know what the rationale, you know what the justification is for undertaking OER work. It means so much in terms of um, what it does for our students and their opportunities. It also means a lot in terms of reinvigorating faculty's teaching practice. When you start redesigning courses, you're thinking in completely new ways about your student learning outcomes. You're thinking in completely new ways about the resources that are available to you and your students to get there, to get your students to what you want them to know and be able to do. And so there's a lot here. If you think about the values that bring people into higher ed, there's a lot here that I think is aligned. So it should be easy to make that case. You want faculty, staff, and administrators to believe that innovating on behalf of better outcomes for students is important and that there's urgency, that it's important now and that the institution values it and expects it. So an example here is, you know, it will be a lot easier to bring people into the work of redesigning courses for OER, developing OER degrees, if they can draw a line between doing that work and then reflecting on it in their annual review process. So ideally, your institution has some kind of process at the end of a semester, at the end of a year, where faculty are reflecting on their accomplishments and that this kind of work is clearly going to be valued and expected. You want faculty, staff, and administrators to understand how the change you're seeking fits with other institutional priorities and how it will impact day-to-day -day work. So hopefully before people undertake the redesign of a course, they understand what this means in terms of their workload, but they also understand how this fits with your institution's strategic plan, what this fits with, you know, where the institution wants to go and where your department and your division want to go. Ideally, OER work is not seen as just one small initiative on a long list of initiatives. I think that kind of thinking is what leads faculty to say, this just feels like the latest fad. I am not going to get involved with this and waste my time. It's, you know, you can totally shift that dynamic if this work is understood as part of the institution's broader strategic priorities. And when faculty are at the table from the beginning and they're helping to drive that, it's not so much now about administrators imposing this on faculty, but rather this is a grassroots effort. Everyone is agreeing that this is going to be really meaningful for students and faculty and now here's our way forward. You want faculty, staff, and administrators to feel respected, heard, and valued by their departments and institutional leaders. And you want everyone working at the institution to believe that they have the support and guidance to be successful in their roles. I see on the list of participants today people who have all different roles at the institution. But I think some of you are in a position to communicate to a dean, to a VP, to a president, the importance of these kinds of um, these dimensions of you know being developed in your institutional climate and I hope that you'll look at this list and think about the extent to which these already exist as part of your institutional climate or if there are ways that your institution needs to shift and evolve so that these become part of the climate but this is the way forward for a healthy climate and when you've established this then the work of change and when we're talking about change I think this OER work is a great example all of that becomes much more possible and success becomes much more likely um, I'm going to pause here. I see a question from Jean asking, how is impact defined? I think, Jean, what you mean is um, when I was talking earlier about the, um, the maybe the impact that faculty are having in their classroom or on their students. Um, we know that there's, you know, different ways to define impact. Impact of cohort-based development. Thank you. So, um, when, I'll give you a, a contrast, a way to think about this, and there's a reference for this. Uh, when people come to, let's say, a 60 or a 90 minute workshop, let's say it's a workshop on active learning or now a workshop on collaborative learning, they learn a few techniques, they take them back, hopefully they try to implement them. What we usually find is half or more of the people who attend a one-off workshop end up not getting a chance to implement whatever they learned. They thought it was really interesting at the time, but they get really busy and they never implement. The folks who do get around to implementing, 
more often than not run into some difficulty. It's pretty normal. Things don't go the way you thought they would when you actually try something in your classroom. And then the problem is if all you've done is gone to one workshop and you're not connected to your institution, Center for Teaching and Learning or other faculty development um, entity, um, then there's no opportunity to get further support in troubleshooting what you just tried. And so I think people are justified in getting discouraged and not going any further with that new innovation in their classroom. By contrast, by contrast, when you're participating in cohort-based development and you have access to your colleagues and other folks from your Center for Teaching and Learning on a monthly basis or perhaps even more frequently, then you can structure this change. People can go and say, I'm trying this. It's the third week of the semester. I'm trying A, B, and C in my class. They come back to the meeting three weeks later. They say, this first thing I did worked really well, and here's why. But reflecting on the second thing, it just it did not go the way I thought it did. And now you're sitting in a room with eight or nine or 10 colleagues who can support you and try to troubleshoot that. So cohort-based development is going to change people's practice. It's going to impact people's practice in the classroom in much more significant ways because when they run into trouble, they have opportunities to come back to their colleagues and get further support. There's a great book, um, uh, you're welcome, Jean, and there's a great book as a reference for that. It's called Faculty Development and Student Learning, Assessing the Connections. It's by William Condon, Ellen Iverson, Catherine Manduka, Carol Rutz, and Gudrun Willett. I will put that reference in the chat for you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, John, uh, so much for that, that thoughtful uh, presentation and also for answering that uh, question from Jean. Um, and now, oh, just a moment here. <laughs> All right, Tom, I'm giving you control. Um, let's see, I think we just had a little glitch there. So uh, next up, um, is Tom Ayers, uh, the Dean of Information Technology and the OER degree lead at Broward College. And uh, just one moment before I turn that over to Tom, we can continue the conversation um, in the chat window um, and we will have a, a, a longer time for Q&A at the end. Um, Tom, please go ahead. Okay. I'm not able to turn on my video. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks, John, for that uh, excellent guidance for all of us. Um, formerly, I was the Associate Dean for Business and IT for the online campus, which is where I wrote and received the ATD OER degree, uh, degree grant. And since becoming college-wide Dean of IT, I've maintained a role with our online campus for both open and competency-based education. A little bit about Broward College. Uh, there I am, thank you. Uh, we're a public state college located in Broward County, Florida. We have three physical campuses, an online campus, and we have quite a few centers located throughout the county. And we serve approximately 64,000 students. We have an incredibly diverse student population and a very high percentage of Pell eligible students. We are an ATD OER degree initiative uh, grantee. And for the 2016-17 uh, academic year, our students were able to save approximately $4.2 million in textbooks cost savings uh, from OER uh, no-cost uh, courses. For a little bit of a historical perspective, in spring of 2014, our students were saving just a little over $250,000. In spring of 2016, that had increased to about a million dollars. And uh, in spring of 2017, the savings were a little over 1.5 million, which led to the academic year uh, estimate of the 4.2 million. So therefore, we, we estimate a cumulative savings of about 9.3 million uh, for the academic years uh, since 2013, when we first uh, started to implement OER courses. Brief history of our OER uh, initiative. Back in 2012, the online campus made a commitment to using OER and other zero cost 
uh, material. We started off mostly with flat world knowledge and OpenStax e-texts. Then in 2014-15, we were a Lumen Learning subgrant awardee, and we participated with them in the development of Waymaker courses. There were four courses that were developed using OER material, an introduction to business, intro to marketing, micro and macroeconomics. Then in 2016, uh, in, and going through 2018, we're an ATD OER degree initiative grantee, and our goal is to have an Associate of Science in Business Administration and Associate of Science in Marketing Management, both online degrees, fully OER, uh, for students to complete. Our future commitments for 2018 is to have a complete OER bachelor's degree. We have a Bachelor of Applied Science degree in Supervision and Management, and we hope to have that completed for a complete OER delivery. And we're working on our website and branding. Uh, we're a Pathways school, and uh, we're going to brand our OER degrees uh, open path. As far as the faculty role goes at Broward, um, our OER uh, degree initiative is in our online college and our online college runs based on uh, commissioned master courses. And these are developed by both full-time and adjuncts. And once a course is developed, uh, faculty who want to teach online agree to, de to deliver that commissioned course with only minor changes. They can add materials to the course, but we don't allow them to take anything away from the course. Majority, and Una, can you turn off my video? I'm, there you go, okay. having internet issues. Uh, and majority of our uh, course delivery is by adjunct faculty. We have a, a small full-time cadre of full-time faculty members at the online campus uh, and a large number of adjuncts. To date, historically, majority of our OER development has been by fully uh, online, full full-time faculty in the online campus. However, adjunct development has dramatically increased over the past three years. The way our OER process uh, works is we typically have faculty uh, falling in uh, one of three categories. They'll either work with Lumen Learning we have a relationship with. They'll look at the OpenStax textbooks, and recently we've been working with OpenStax and Newton. Uh, Newton is an adaptive platform, and we're doing a pilot with a chemistry course right now with OpenStax and Newton. And then we have just faculty curated or developed courses um, that are, are led strictly by the faculty member along with our um, faculty librarian. Whenever someone is commissioned to develop an OER course for Broward, they'll have an initial meeting with an online faculty librarian. The librarian will uh, prepare a, an extensive search of materials for that course and present them with a, a library guide for their topics. And then the librarian will also help facilitate uh, professional development opportunities. Our Center for Teaching, Education, and Learning offers a, a, a general introduction to OER in terms of resources and uh, different types of licensing that are available, CC licensing and things like that. And then working with the librarian, they'll review other opportunities for webinars and resources, def definitely CCC OER uh, website is a great resource uh, for our faculty. And they, they, kind of, they kind of set that plan with the librarian and uh, work closely with our uh, Center for Teaching, Education, and Learning uh, throughout the semester. We have um, moved towards a full integration of material from uh, OpenStax or if we're using uh, non-Lumen Learning Waymaker courses to incorporate that material directly into our um, LMS instead of keeping it as a third-party OER 
uh, text. And what we found is that this helps us increase the faculty student engagement in these courses. When we remove the e-text and all the material is in the course, the faculty member, both full-time and adjunct, teaching that course becomes the expert to the student. That they, they're not referring to the textbook, they're working with the material and then referring to the instructor. So we found that to be a very positive uh, tool for increasing uh, faculty student engagement. And the last thing I am going to talk about before we turn it over to our wonderful adjunct faculty member who uh, will share her experiences is our scalability um, goals and, and uh, initiative for the ATD OER degree. So everything that we're developing in the online campus as fully online commissioned OER courses is being redeveloped by faculty from the campuses for use in their blended uh, commissioned master courses, in, which are our hybrid courses where, where students uh, have reduced face-to-face -face time and then have some online material, and also in our face-to-face -face courses. So our online campus is currently just below the size of our smallest physical campus. So in this redevelopment, we're going to tremendously increase that opportunity of savings of $2.4 million to the physical campuses where that can easily double or triple uh, within the next year or two. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Claudine. Okay, thank you. Um, I, um, oh, actually, Tanya had a question. I don't know if you want to answer that before I, before I go. Sure, let me take a look at that. I am not seeing the question box. Uh, I can read that to you. I, I have it. Okay. Okay, so what we're doing with the uh, material, since we're using the material that has the CC um, uh, licensing. Tom, could, you repeat, could you repeat the question for some of the people might just be on the phone today? Sure. So the question was, how are you presenting the text material to the students? When you say integrated, are these PDFs or presented as HTML pages in your LMS? Have you been surprised by any requests for printed copies? We have actually not had a lot of, of requests for printed copies. Uh, our LMS allows students to print things out. So the fact that they don't have the textbook, they've seemed to be very comfortable with printing what they want to print. Um, I don't hear of a lot of printing. Um, our, our, our students have become accustomed to, to doing uh, stuff online and we're mobile. So our web pages are adjustable to tablets and, and cell phones. So that may have helped as well. Anecdotally, I've heard of students, you know, on the bus, you know, reading off of their phone and, and things like that. So printing has not been an issue for us. And yes, we're, ingre we're integrating it into HTML uh, formats in our LMS, um, you know, repurposing the, the, the material from the, the e-text. Great. Th thank you, Tom. And we'll turn this over to Claudine and we can answer um, additional questions um, at the end. Okay. Thank you, Una. Um, I, Una, you mentioned before you said that we are all three experts in this. And I just want to start by saying I can't call myself an expert in OER. I am on a learning journey and uh, have gained a number of insights in that time. And I will share those with you and hope that they um, are also helpful, um, helpful to you. Um, I have been a faculty member and administrator in higher education for over 10 years, um, but for several of those years um, as a faculty member, I was acutely unaware of, of textbook costs, um, but then that changed. Um, and I know a lot of you are very familiar probably with the story I'm about to tell, um, but uh, Several years ago, I was teaching an online business law class, and I noticed that you know a lot of my students hadn't gotten into the swing of things a few weeks into class. 
and they were submitting assignments that were um, not on point. It was clear they hadn't read or referred to the book. Uh, and it didn't take long to find out, you know, the reason why the students, uh, some of the students in the class didn't even purchase the, the book. And these were students, obviously, who were making decisions about their budgets and paying bills and balancing that uh, against the purchase of a $150 textbook for a single class. Uh, and this was a business law class. And business law obviously has a, a set of concepts and, and case law that really doesn't change um, much. And what does change uh, can be updated easily by, you know, referring to new articles or other open source materials. So obviously what I was experiencing was uh, this inequity in access to uh, education. And uh, the courses, even though the students didn't have the, obviously have the money to spend on this $150 book, and the course was not set up to provide them the same content in a free or inexpensive way. And so the students were not able to adequately learn the material and participate in this learning community. And I put a quote up here. This is, I, I'm sharing this from kind of the adjunct faculty perspective and in learning these things and, and having eyes opened um, and, and hope, hopefully that helps you with your uh, adjunct population as well. But the quote I have on here is from that 2011 article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. About seven in 10 college students said they had not purchased text textbooks at least once because they found the price too high. And I know that there is some more recent research as well that shows that these same conditions still exist. And obviously the result um, from that traditional textbook model is that you know, money um, is that barrier to accessing education. Um, as I mentioned, I'm relatively new to using uh, OER. I've been teaching as an adjunct at Broward College for just over a year. And from the start, I've been using OER in my classes. So that's been, um, that's been a great experience. But more recently, I've been fortunate enough to redevelop a fully OER business law class. And uh, I still have the same rigor in the class, the same depth to the assignments and assessments. Um, I also have the same types of discussions uh, with students about business law topics. Um, but obviously, the huge difference is that I've not had the same discussions with students about money constraints. Uh, preventing them from purchasing a textbook or accessing the content um, for the course. So this has obviously shifted the equation from, you know, money being a barrier to education to really the student's effort um, allowing them to access the education. Uh, in addition to teaching as an adjunct at Broward College, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I also adjunct and develop um, courses at another university uh, in a program with an emphasis on e-discovery. And if you're not familiar with e-discovery, it's, it's a relatively new, newish field, um, about 10 years old or so, uh, but there's very little in the way of textbooks or other academic materials um, for it. So when, when developing courses, we had maybe enough material for some of the introductory courses, but as it got more advanced and later in the program, um, there were a few books that were extremely expensive, you know, $200 for a, a single book for a course. Uh, and because we were kind of on the, you know, cutting edge of, of presenting these academic um, topics, we were faced with this big challenge of having to now design and develop these courses with um, very limited uh, traditional textbooks available. And seeing how OER was used at Broward uh, gave me some great ideas for how to develop those courses and how to design those courses using resources and innovation um, in the e-discovery program. So the benefit has been far and wide. I often focus on the cost savings to students when I think about OER, um, but I also think it's important to note that the benefit, there's benefits of having you know, very specific OER content that's available outside of, of traditional textbooks when it comes to um, um, very um, uh, specialized areas. Many of uh, adjunct faculty members attended, including myself, attended traditional colleges and paid the price for the textbooks. And as a result, when you're, when you're working with your adjunct, um, some may enter the OER realm with a little bit of hesitancy, thinking that there is some difference in the value or rigor of the content. And so this is a challenge um, that I actually undertook myself. Um, I have developed business law classes for other universities using publisher textbooks. And, uh, and as I mentioned, also recently developed uh, an OER business law class for Broward College. 
and the same concepts, vocabulary, objectives, case law, et cetera, were covered in both sets of materials in both classes. So if you are encountering some of that hesitancy for any reason with your adjuncts, um, then I would just encourage you to make that comparison for them or encourage them to make that comparison um, in, in a way that uh, they can see the, the comparison and, and the, the, um, that same level being met through both um, open source and um, priced uh, publisher textbooks. I wanted to share um, a couple of slides on my best practices for engaging adjunct faculty in OER. And again, these are just things that either hooked me initially in looking at OER or I found to be valuable since beginning to work with OER. Uh, and this slide here has some of the, um, the WIFMs. So if you're looking to work with adjuncts and are you trying to gain, gain some buy-in for OER, um, it's good to look at the, you know, what's in it for me uh, points as a start. And obviously, if you use master classes like Broward does, or if your courses are all faculty developed each instance, these may change, but I'm hoping that these are, are helpful to you. Um, the first, have freedom and control to find and use the resources that help you teach and enhance academic content. Uh, as I mentioned, I was developing e-discovery courses, and um, it was wonderful to find these resources that included um, software usage and uh, software tutorials, for example, for the very specialized e-discovery um, software that I use. Um, and if you have adjuncts also who are professional, professionals working in the field currently or have recently worked in the field, um, they may have also a lot of resources that they've encountered um, that, that are open uh, for use to be able to embed in a course. Um, so that's something that gives them a sense of ownership over their classes, which I think is something John had mentioned as well, that kind of co-ownership over their classes if they're taking, um, you know, what they've seen or used um, out in the field and are able to bring it into the, um, the course. Um, the updating your courses as trends or time requires, but not at the whim of publisher updates. I'm sure every faculty member has had this same experience where uh, these update, publisher updates come at just the most inconvenient time and uh, with the most inconvenient time, timelines uh, for updating course, course requirements. Uh, and you can always customize the books in order to avoid that, but then of course that, that requires some additional cost as well. So, and as uh, Dr. Ayers mentioned, um, embedding the content in the course and taking them and, and embedding them in the HTML pages uh, helps this uh, even more, having all of that material there, and then obviously updating it uh, as, as, as time requires. And teach knowing that your course has lowered the money barrier to education. Uh, as an adjunct faculty member, students tell me about their, their uh, money problems. They tell me about their experiences in their life. Um, and, uh, you know, teaching is, is sometimes a, a very, you know, personal relationship with the student. And um, they tell me about those problems, whether or not they should. Uh, and so when you're teaching with OER, as I mentioned, I've never had those conversations teaching at Broward um, about, um, you know, the cost of the books being prohibitive or those kinds of issues that have come up uh, several times uh, at other schools. And on this slide, I listed some additional best practices that I've experienced in working with Broward College on OER development. Um, you probably all already have a process to identify your courses in need of revision or redevelopment and have a process to identify the faculty who can perform the development work. Um, but I would also just encourage you to, um, uh, to try to pair up faculty with their interests. Um, using OER does take some time and effort to put together, you know, a great course, and it's um, this wonderful, invigorating, you know, energy-filled experience. Um, it's exciting, um, but it also takes time and effort, and so pairing a faculty member up um, with, um, with their interests, I think, is, is just an important where, place to start. And in capital letters, um, provide training and support. This has been hugely important for, for me. Uh, the, as, as Dr. Ayers mentioned, the librarian um, initially uh, provided this wonderful guide of, um, of business law sources for me to use and to refer to uh, and to kind of start my journey off in, in redeveloping the business law course for Broward College. And um, that has been um, invaluable. 
and also the initial webinar on the value and process of OER development, and then just ongoing support and touch point um, regular check-ins and support from internal and external resources has been, um, has been very necessary to me uh, continuing on that path and, and, and staying in a, on track with, um, with that development. And then of course the process for continuous review and updating. Um, and I think John mentioned recognition as well is, is very important too. Um, so those are my, um, my best practices and, uh, and, and, that's, and that's it. But it's been a great experience starting to work with OER and uh, continuing on that process. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Claudine and um, Tom. And um, I look forward to uh, next time you join us for um, an event like this, to, uh, giving us more feedback from your students on how those OER courses are going. It would be wonderful to hear, um, hear about that as well, directly from student quotes and so forth. Um, before we go to Q&A, I just want to mention a few things that are coming up. Um, and um, of course, we have uh, on our CCCOER website, we keep a list of upcoming um, education conferences, particularly with an emphasis on um, open education. So DREAM 2018 is coming up in February. Uh, the Open Ed Consortium's um, OE Global, which is a wonderful conference to go to to meet um, open education folks from around the globe is in April and you can see more of that under our get involved menu. If you're not on our community email list and you'd like to, you can go to this uh, uh, web link here, uh, cccoer.org community email and request to be added. And uh, you can watch our past webinars uh, and this webinar will be posted within a few days for uh, those maybe colleagues of yours who couldn't make it and they get posted under cccoer.org slash webinar. And um, our webinars will res resume uh, probably in early February 2018. So we wish you all a happy winter holidays. And um, now we're going to go back to the questions. Um, and we'll just take this through to the end of our webinar. We have, we have about eight minutes. Um, so um, please, uh, we're looking forward to your questions. Um, I saw one uh, from Michelle. Uh, and uh, Tom, she was asking you, does your college charge for printing the pages? And I'm assuming this is the pages in your LMS. The, there are computer labs on campuses that students are able to uh, print in. They're usually specific to the courses. Um, they can go to the library and print for pay. Um, so yeah, they would have to pay for their own. My experience is that they, they do it off campus. They would print them at home as they need them. Um, I'm not seeing a need for students aren't asking for a textbook printout. So there is a charge and students are pretty much doing that on their own. Thank you, Tom. Um, we had a couple of comments, I, I, comments slash, I'm not sure if they were questions from Daniel. And um, I think these are, are interesting um, things to think about. He said, I wish that colleges would adopt Kindle or Chromebook for students to get their texts on. And he also mentions, um, uh, Dragon, I'm, su I'm assuming you're Dragon speaking naturally, or other text to audio tools helpful for students who read slowly. Um, any, any input on that, uh, Tom or Claudine? Well, our LMS um, allows um, text to, to audio, so students are able to get a text of, of every page that we have. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I think Daniel is, is concerned about accessibility. He mentions eye strain. Uh, in using computer screens to read from. Right, so, so they do have the text to audio and they have the option to, to print out. Okay, thank you for that. Um, all right, uh, we, um, we are waiting for other questions. Um, you can take the microphone as well if you don't want to type in the chat window at this time. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, perhaps John, do you have any comments that you would like to add at this point um, based on um, the uh, programs we heard about from Tom and Claudine? I think what we've heard today is really great example, um, not just of the technical aspects of how to 
develop and evolve your thinking around working in the OER space, but also how to bring people in and, um, and really to, to go beyond surface level buy-in. I think, you know, I want to acknowledge this looks different at different institutions. Each institution has its own culture. Each institution has its own constraints. Each institution has its own opportunities. So I think it's important to be um, realistic and authentic about what's happening at your institution. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach, but I do think what we heard today from our colleagues is a great example. And I hope that it gets people thinking um, because it would really be a shame. OER to me is a great example of an opportunity for full-time and adjunct faculty to come together in service of their students' success and in service of reinvigorating their own classroom practice. I think there are very few other um, big change initiatives that I can think of right now that are really picking up um, momentum that work this way where faculty can get on board together in a truly collaborative way across that barrier that we often see between full-time and adjunct colleagues. And it's really in service of student success and their own classroom practice. I think it's difficult to find another example that works so well across so many different dimensions of what happens at an institution. Wonderful, thank you, John. And um, Daniel um, is a little concerned about um, OER not adequately incorporating instructor input in academic freedom. And I, I think I'll just say, Daniel, and then I'll open this up to the rest of the folks here, to Tom and Claudine that what we've heard here from John and Tom is that um, there are opportunities for people to bring their own um, materials into the into this uh, space and um, that in order to get the ownership uh, around a course that is that really um, makes a teacher effective in the classroom um, that academic freedom is key and that it should be a grassroots effort and not a top down. But um, Tom, would you like to speak to that one as well? Yes, in, in our case, everything is, is faculty uh, led. Um, our, we have one curriculum across our college. All of our campuses teach from the same uh, course outlines that all the faculty approve and everything that's done uh, in the development is done off of that outline and it has to meet all the, the student learning outcomes and the material are, are all selected by the faculty member who's developing the course. And for example, in, in Claudine's case, she is matching up all of the materials that she finds as the subject matter expert designing the course. And then that goes through a subject an additional subject matter expert faculty member who signed on to give um, Claudine feedback on what she's done and recommend any uh, any additional things that they may see that she might want to consider. So uh, there's at least two full-time faculty members involved and then we go through a quality uh, matters review in which um, <clears throat> the designer reviews uh, all of the, the points in quality matters, and then the associate dean, who's also an expert in the area, reviews. So um, it is faculty-led, and um, second faculty member gets to provide input for the course, and then uh, the associate dean and designer gets to also collaborate with the faculty member. Great. Thank you, Tom, and, and thank you, Daniel, for that question, because it's a really good one, and it's, we know it's really critical that it, this is faculty-led. Um, Claudine, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, um, to for any um, closing remarks on um, based on the discussion. Uh, well, certainly, I, I I just wanted to reiterate how at least um, how I've been able to change uh, how I develop and design courses, um, not just at Broward but um, elsewhere as well with OER, and and that it is. Um, I think John mentioned, um, you know, just it is a way to uh, reinvigorate how we design and how we teach our classes, um, and and it's and I I felt that, and so I would just you know encourage you to, or encourage everyone to continue to you know push this and find ways to to uh, 
to incorporate it into your institution. Uh, thank you, Claudine. I'm so glad you brought that up, um, that um, adjunct faculty teach at multiple institutions for the most part, and that um, they can be great evangelists for open education at the institutions that are not currently using it. So thank you for sharing that. Well, I, I think we're just at the uh, end of the hour here. If there are no, um, no other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recorder. And I wanna thank my, my speakers today, uh, John, Tom, and Claudine. Um, this has been really invaluable information for everyone. And we really appreciate you joining us.